Just give him praise and worship him tonight. We thank you tonight. We come before your presence so that we might live. It is written that because you live, we shall live also. And so we come to you that we might live. In Jesus' mighty name, we we'll pray. Quietly, I would like you to take your seat as we proceed from where we stopped yesterday. In the spirit realm, there are resources. There are resources in the spirit realm. God makes these resources available so that we can appropriate them. Hallelujah. I say hallelujah. Yeah. So yesterday evening we began to look up on some resources, spiritual things. Amen. I don't know if anybody still remembers what a spiritual thing is. Based on our definition yesterday night, we saw that a spiritual thing is a reality that exists or finds expression within the domain of a spirit being. Now, if you are going to have to encounter those realities, you must of necessity first and foremost encounter that spirit being. All right? Those realities are in that spirit being, contained in that spirit being. And the spirit being manifests those realities. And except you are in the environment of the oppression of that being, you will not have access to those dimensions of realities. Just like we have physical realities, we also have spiritual realities. And every spiritual man must know how to appropriate these realities. And so the Bible makes us to understand that we have received a spirit which is not of this world but a spirit which is of God that we may know the things freely given to us of God there are some things that God has given us and you cannot know those things except you have received the spirit that is of God because it's a spirit of God that has the capacity to access the depths of God and bring out of God the things of God hallelujah I say hallelujah Amen. there are some parts of cookie state if somebody fractures his leg and he comes for treatment you will not see things like crepe bandage the use of crepe bandage is not required. All they do is that they get a chicken, break the leg, and they begin to administer therapy, spiritual therapy to that leg, the chicken, the leg of the chicken. And you see that the effect of what they are doing on the chicken is transferred to the person that has a broken leg. Hallelujah. A cure is being administered, but it's through spiritual realities. Are you with me? The first person that discovered medicine was actually an Egyptian. The version of medicine that he discovered was spiritual. His name was 
immortal. So because people could not go to school and learn and train and become doctors in that order, they now nullified his own approach towards medicine. They wanted something that could be taught, in, something that could be synthesized in the laboratory. And that's why the ancestor of medicine that we quote today is an Indian because he's the first man that came and brought leaves, could explain how those leaves were able to administer cure. But the point is this, we have physical realities, we also have spiritual realities. Hallelujah. Imotem was using the spiritual formula to administer healing. He could, he could not teach you what he was doing. He can't even explain it, but he knows that if he does this and he does that, he will get this kind of result. There are resources in the spirit realm that God wants us to take advantage of. The reason why Christianity is actually suffering is sorry, is sorry, is subjected to a sorry situation. It's because most people do not know the God that they proclaim. Hallelujah. The Bible makes us to understand that God is spirit. And because God is spirit, he has spiritual resources that he makes available for us to function in his kingdom. I pray that God will help us today in the name of Jesus. Go a step higher from where we went yesterday. Yesterday we saw spiritual food. We began to discuss how to access spiritual food. And we emphasize that anybody that does not have constant supply of spiritual food is not capable of fulfilling a God-ordained destiny. He can start or she can start. But whenever you begin to see that somebody knows his call and he seems incapacitated in consistently remaining in the field of that call, the person is devoid, has a lack, a fatal lack. And the lack that the person suffers is not a physical lack. Is a lack of spiritual supplies because the angel came to Elijah and said to him rise and eat for the journey is far now spiritual food is required in keeping with a particular journey now have you ever seen somebody before a mighty preacher and then suddenly he did not die but his voice died still alive but his voice just died and then you now travel to a city, you now find out that, ah, he even has a program this weekend. There was a time that he had a voice. His voice spread across many nations. But while he was still alive, he was reduced to something equal to nothing. That is an indication of the fact that he no longer has resources to keep with the pace of the journey. He lacks spiritual food. Now, so the average believer lacks food supply and that's why christianity is a drag for so many people its potency and power is no longer felt in the lives of men and that's why we dedicate this weekend to exploring the spirit realm the resources that god has made available his intention for us how he has designed for us to live supernaturally in a world that has satanic restraints what he has provided to ensure that our victory is consistent and triumphant the lord bless you in the name of jesus christ so we saw spiritual food if you were not here yesterday i counsel you to pick the tape if you were not in this place yesterday amen have you ever encountered a situation where Maybe you traveled somewhere, you went somewhere, and the kind of water they gave you to take your bath, you just felt, if I take my bath with this kind of water, I'm not sure of what will happen thereafter. And on the account of your judgment, you decided to withdraw. Even though you were supposed to stay there for four days, it, you, were, you felt better off not taking your bath for four days because of the nature of the water that was around. There is a need, a great need for refreshing in the natural. 
just like there is a need for refreshing in the supernatural dimension if you have stayed for four days without taking your bath before the way you feel you are not sick if they bring food for you you can still eat all right if they bring drink you can drink but there's a feeling that you have and because of that feeling of lack of refreshing and refreshment you don't seem to be like yourself that reality also finds expression in the spiritual plane amen so the first thing we saw yesterday as a spiritual thing is food we saw spiritual food spiritual food as we defined it yesterday is the proceeding word of God that word that God is saying now to you carries along with it spiritual energy especially if it places a demand for you to fulfill something for God and so Jesus could say that my meat is to do the will of him that sent me and to finish his work as long as Jesus was running with a sense of purpose that was tied to a consciousness of the will of God spiritual energy kept flowing into we said yesterday that the power of God flows in the direction of the purpose of God the strength of God flows in the direction of the counsel of God are you with me if God's counsel is not with you God may have no reason to send the resources of strength and power to, 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 to energize you on the account of that which he expects your life to deliver. And so any man that is existing and living outside of the revealed will of God for his life has no guarantee of fulfilling anything whatsoever. He may have the ability to start spiritual things but he will not be able to conclude them because he's not in the terrain where he can access spiritual food so that he can receive strength to take over from his weakness. Did you get that? We saw all of that yesterday. Now turn with me to the book of Acts of the Apostles. I'd like you to be attentive. We need a few hours this night to capture some things. A few hours as we do some Bible study in Jesus' name. 15 minutes to the end of my sermon, you can start playing. I want to get to the heart of the people. So for now, you stop. Acts of the Apostles, chapter 3. Peter made a statement on the day of Pentecost that I would like us to, to see. Sorry, not on the day of Pentecost. He made... A statement in the book of Acts of the Apostles, chapter 3, are like us to look upon. It was a long discourse. Verse 17, the Bible says, And now, brethren, I would that through ignorance you did it as did also your fathers. But those things which God before had showed by the mouth of his prophets that Christ should suffer, he had so fulfilled. Verse 19. Repent ye therefore and be converted that your sins may be blotted out when times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord. Hallelujah. Now, we, we, we see a statement that Peter is making here. He says, repent and be thou converted. When times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord. His utterance revealed to us a promise, a possibility. utterance unveiled to us that in God there is the possibility of experiencing refreshing notice that he did not say time 
a time of refreshing will come. But he said, times of refreshing will come from the presence of the Father. Indicative of the fact that it is a reality that needs to be reoccurring. Times, not just a time of refreshing, but what? Times of refreshing. Now, I would like us to bear particular notice of that phrase and to uphold the, the implication thereof as touching the presence of that S there. Times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord. Just like that guy that had not taken his bath for four days is not sick but is not refreshed. I think the closest situation to an infirmity in the physical context of it is when a man lacks refreshing. Have you ever entered a room that is stuffy? The windows have been closed for six months. And then you were assigned that accommodation to be the place of your abode. They, there is a sense, I don't know. <laughs> That's the way it feels. You don't just feel okay because there's no refreshing. There's no ventilation. That is bringing refreshing from outside. For natural life to continue, there is need for us to be exposed to refreshing. And refreshing comes with renewal. All right? When um, fresh air blows through this window and then it pushes the still air inside of your room, outside of that window, and then you just feel good because God created us with a, uh, 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 for, with a need for refreshing. Also in the spiritual context, there are facilities that God has put in place to ensure that we are refreshed. And I'm going to show you the consequences or the symptoms that find expression when someone is not exposed to spiritual refreshing. Meanwhile, first of all, I need to show you how to access spiritual refreshing. Times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Father. Amen. You must understand that in your work with God, there are seasons you are going to encounter. Different kinds of seasons. There are some times that you will be in a season of revival. Things are going for you. Especially, you just begin to see that you, you hear God easily, you study the Bible, and the Bible is, you know, Hallelujah. You study the Bible and in your study you see that God is breaking out, teaching you so many things, rebuking several aspects of your life and the Bible becomes living to you. It's not going to be like that forever. Because a time will come when God will want to subject you to a test to see whether the things that you have been receiving, you believe it. You see, oh my God. He wants to bring you into a reality. Not just that you know a book in your head. He wants you to understand the reality of that which you have read as it is expressed experientially. And so you don't know a truth except you have been brought to a corridor where you can experience its administration. The reality of God is an experience that we have testimony of in the Bible. Do you get it now? Now so, you begin to study in times of revival, you begin to pray, and as you are praying like that, it's sweet, everything is going well, and all of that. And a time will come when the season will change. It will be a time where you need to put to work the things that God has been ministering to you. You need to put to work the things that God has been investing inside of you. In that season, it will look as though God has withdrawn. And then you need to walk by faith. The good feelings you used to have when you pray, it will be withdrawn. The wonderful atmosphere you used to enjoy in the privacy of your bedroom. Those days in the times of revival will, will cease. It is in those seasons of transition that strong people become weak. 
men of mighty faith suddenly start becoming weak and confusion begins to set into their minds whether God is really as strong as they thought he was. That condition of weakness and doubt is a symptom that indicates that this person is far from the corridors of refreshing. When you see a man speaking with faith and power, two years after you now find him doubting the very things that he spoke about in faith, you see that lack of refreshing, that is what has created the condition that is operating in at that point in time. And so, once upon a time, I was a part of a fellowship, and we had so many people that desired to know God intimately. Our way was a way of prayer and fasting. I was the teacher of the group. And my duty was to administer the counsel of God. Hallelujah. In the teaching ministry, there's something I can tell you. Because I've been in it for like 18 years now. Teaching the Bible from place to place. There are times where revelations flow like tap. If you are wise, those times you begin to write them down. Because as it's flowing like that, just understand that you are going to go through a process thereafter. You can even take those revelations and preach. Even when it is premature. Because you have not experienced the things that God is revealing to you yet. <laughs> Hallelujah. And you have sufficient scriptures, especially if you have been in a teaching ministry for long. You have sub sufficient scriptures to communicate it. And then suddenly, God will allow the seasons to shift. And when the seasons shift, those flow of revelation will cease. That torrent of insight that was coming to you will cease for a moment. In that moment when the flow of revival ceases, God expects you to understand that you need times of refreshing. Within that gap where there's a seizure of, of revival around the technology of survival in those times is that you need to activate times of refreshing. If not, you will doubt the things you preached. In the seasons where God wants to subject you to a process that will establish those things God revealed to you so that it becomes as much a part of you at your, as your beating heart. Let me give you some examples. Once upon a time, I began to study the covenant that God had with Israel. First of all, the father of Israel, Abraham, his life became a case study. Because if we are going to talk about blessings in the Bible, we must set our compass and our coordinates to Genesis chapter 12. Every talk about blessing that doesn't have its bearing on Genesis 12 is a fallacy. Redemption in itself began with Abraham. Finds its center and circumference in Christ and its goal is the kingdom. Hallelujah. Now, so if we want to talk about blessing, we must of necessity come to Abraham and use him as the pivot upon which we can understand the perspective of God's blessings, the context of God's blessings, and the mechanism of God's blessings, which is a covenant. When I studied his life, I began to see a few things. Hallelujah. God wanted him to be opened up to a resource base that is not subject to depletion. But before he can access it, God began to make demands upon him. Because in the covenant that God established between himself and Abraham, that covenant was not physical, it was a spiritual covenant. Just like your salvation today. 
Your salvation today is an extension. In fact, it is existing on the platform of the covenant that God made with Abraham. Hallelujah. I don't have time to go into all of that. We'll do that next year. When we talk about prosperity. What is prosperity? For three months. <laughs> ah, amen. And somehow, God was able to get Abraham to come to that point where an agreement was established. And on the strength of the agreement that was established, God willed the earth to him. Because the Bible says that in Abraham shall all the families of the earth be blessed. It was as if he was the custodian of blessings in the earth realm. And if blessings are going to by any means flow into any family of the earth, it must find expression from that covenant that God has established with Abraham. Are you still with me? So if we talk blessings, we must stress it to Abraham. Then I began to see how God, when the covenant began to work out, this guy goes for war. He conquers. He brings back the captives of war. And normally when you go to war, you win war. In fact, the guys that were conquered and kept in captivity that Abraham went to deliver because of his relative. The guys that Abraham had to fight with to deliver the captives from their hands were actually the kings of the earth. So at that time that Abraham conquered those kings, he was actually the strongest singular entity that was upon the face of the earth that time. Now, this man was coming back from battle and then suddenly he had an encounter. And a personality now comes and begins to call him by a strange kind of name and to give him a strange kind of salutation. Blessed be Abraham of the Most High God, possessor of heaven and earth. Now, wait, I'm coming. That salutation was not a revelation of Abraham. It was a revelation of the God of Abraham. Because the God of Abraham was the possessor of heaven. As at the time that the revelation came and the salutation came, Abraham was already the possessor of the earth that time. Because he conquered the major kings that were in the earth. I don't have time to go into all of that. He was the chief of the earth. If he was the gallant man of the earth. If you want to take a decision that you have to do with the community of nations in the earth, you must have to consult with. Suddenly this guy goes to fight and he's coming back. Man, I'm good. And he has an encounter. And then a revelation about his God, an additional revelation about his God comes to him. That God is the possessor of heaven and earth. On the strength of that, he took bread and wine from the priests that brought this strange insight and he paid tithes to him. By paying tithes to him, he was saying that I acknowledge the fact that I'm human, I'm limited, I am insufficient, but I come into covenant with God based on this revelation that you have brought. Now I can see that even this earth now that I'm claiming that I'm the one, I'm the dominion here, I'm actually a tenant. So that was a revelation that was flowing in him. And then the king of Sodom and Gomorrah came and said, all right, you have helped us to restore our nation. You have gone as far as bringing our people out of captivity. We offer you all the wealth that you have redeemed. Only give unto us our people so that we can go and continue our nation. Is that not a good, good deal? The burden of the people, let it be with us. You just go with the stuff. Meanwhile, that is the kind of agreement that the devil wants to enter into with any pastor. Take the goods, give us the souls.
Hallelujah. And Abraham said, this is a good deal. A good bargain. Nevertheless, before you came, I entered into another dimension of covenant. I was expecting that he would have, that would have been the breakthrough. He would have declared breakthrough that day. But he said, on the account of the revelation I just contacted, I am sure of the fact that I'm going to be rich. Are you with me? So I don't want you to be able to boast that you had a hand in my riches. Because of that, I will not receive. Your offering is, is, is I see your heart. Good heart. You have acknowledged my skills in battle. And you want to sow a seed so that I will not one day wake up and get angry with you people and decide to. I understand it. But you see, I have, I have, I have committed myself. Are you still with me now? And because of that, I lifted up my hands to the most high. Now, if you are sitting in the hall, lift your hand. Let me see. No, not hand. He didn't say I lift up my hand. He said I lifted up my hands. All right. How do you look? That's the state of surrender. When your two hands are lifted, it means you cannot use anyone to grab a weapon. He said, when I came to this understanding of the fact that this God that called me out from the land of my fathers is the possessor of the heavens and all his vast forces and also of the earth. I lifted up my hands to him. Then I came into covenant with him by paying a tithe to his priest that brought this revelation. So I'm sure of all the supply I need for my work on it. And I don't want your name to be attached to the story of my wealth. Now, what exactly did Abraham see that made him make that choice? He rejected physical goods because of a revelation that he captured. The first thing we must understand about that covenant that God entered into with Abraham is that it's a spiritual covenant. See, the extent to which you can exploit and exploit is the degree to which you have revelation about it. That's how it works in this kingdom. Do you understand? Your height, your strength, your ability is tied to the revelation of God that you have. You can do Bible study for 12 years except you have a revelation of him. You are not going to amount to anything. And that's why beyond the pastor's work, you must also have a private work with God. A private altar. Where God can expound and expose you to things peculiarly. God can bring you into dimensions personally. What Abraham encountered was far from physical. Because on the strength of what he encountered, he rejected physical things. Because of his assurance of the outcome of that covenant that he was working on. Are you with me? Spiritual. So in this order, in this kingdom, operating under this covenant, you will have to receive the things spiritually first before it manifests in the natural. If it happens otherwise, you are not operating on the covenant of Abraham. Are you with me now? Something happened which I need us to see. Now that we have understood that. So a spiritual man, he lives by the witness of the Holy Spirit. He lives by the revelation that the Holy Spirit brings to him. That is what improves the quality of his life. The carnal man lives by his senses. Lives by his skills. Lives by his effort. Are you with me now? Now, so if you are going to be a spiritual man, you come to realize that you cannot do without the person of the Holy Spirit who is the custodian of all spiritual reality. Something significant happened on the day of Pentecost and I need to bring it to our knowledge. Don't forget where we have come from. The Bible promises us times of refreshing 
that will come from a location. And the location that he revealed was the presence of the Father. And any man that doesn't have access to consistent refreshing in the kingdom will become stale. Hallelujah. Do you realize that it is possible for a preacher's message to become stale? All right. He is doing Bible study, saying new things, but it's not coming out with refreshing. And so he doesn't administer grace to any soul that is weary. Hallelujah. Now, so the technology of refreshment in the kingdom of God must be captured. That is what guarantees that your strides in the kingdom are kept consistent. Amen. I don't know if you have <laughs> sat in a congregation and there was no refreshing coming from the pulpit. That's when you find yourself sleeping. You know, those days we used to sleep and we thought we, there was a demon that made us sleep. The point is that there was no refreshing. And just after many years again, I went for a service and there was no refreshing and I found myself sleeping. The symptoms of sleep. The Lord give you understanding. <laughs> In Jesus' mighty name. Refreshing is a resultant effect that finds expression whenever we are filled with the Holy Spirit. The experience of being filled with the Holy Spirit is something that must be consistent in your life. Not just once. Not just the day you, gave, uh, you were baptized in the Holy Spirit. But we should get filled with the Holy Spirit every day. And that's why the Bible calls it times of refresh. Now let's see a few scriptures. Acts In Acts chapter 2 verse 4, you are going to see that these people got filled with the Holy Spirit. In Acts chapter 4 verse 30, 31, you will see again that they got filled with the Holy Spirit. And that's how God intends that we we'll consistently get filled with the Holy Spirit. In fact, your day has not yet started until you are filled with the Holy Spirit. If you get filled with the Holy Spirit before you start your day, you can be sure that that day, you will not operate in the flesh that day. Because God has not only filled you, he has also deposited in you the resources required for you to represent him that day. The day you operate in the flesh, the day you lie, the day you steal, it's likely to be the day that you were not filled. Hallelujah. Amen. The day you came under pressure and yielded to that pressure, it's likely to be a day that you were not filled with the Holy Spirit. You were devoid of refreshing. Hallelujah. Now let's do Bible study. Now that I'm sure that you are here, let's do Bible study. Turn with me to the book of Mark chapter 15. Mark, Mark 16. Verse 15 says, And he said unto them, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned, and these signs shall follow them that believe. In my name they shall cast out devils, they shall speak with new tongues. Stop there. That's my emphasis. Now, I'm wondering why the Bible did not say they shall speak with tongues. What did he say? <laughs> they shall speak with what? I checked it in the Greek. I don't want to bother you with Greek words. But the translation in the Greek says fresh, not new, but fresh. That takes us to the closest relative natural relative of that dimension that we can take draw understanding from is wine 
my village is in the mangrove forest and there's a lot of palm trees there and there's something that finds expression with a multitude of palm trees the name of it is palm wine <laughs> palm wine amen okay Tony understand what I was talking about now when you harvest palm wine there's one the, the, that one that they are not mixed is very sweet and it can also it can slay you now that's what I heard it's not as if I've tried the experiment myself so all right amen so palm wine has stronger effect when it is new when it's fresh do you understand it good the influence their capacity for palm wine to intoxicate is tied to its freshness is that so all right so the bible is saying that people my people jesus is saying my people will be identified not just that they speak in tongues no because somebody living in sin constantly that was baptized in the holy spirit in 1985 might still mumble some things and we may not know the difference whether it is tongues or not we in the natural except god administers discernment to us we may not know those utterances were actually utterances of the holy spirit that were vocalized are you still with me all right the bible says that this sign shall follow them that believe they shall speak in fresh tongue a man that is vitally connected only men that are vitally connected to christ in the present can speak fresh tongue i mean when you speak in tongues and that is a product of being filled with the holy spirit that point where your utterances become fluid that point where you don't meditate about what to say before you say it it flows out you have the, the river has busted out and it has taken your vocal capacity and the utterances are coming like that with with a frequency he said whenever you see people pray and they come to that point where their tongue is fresh and it carries the power that is equivalent to fresh palm wine all the intoxicating abilities in fresh palm wine how it makes somebody you see all those traits find expression it means that this person is speaking not the tongue of yesterday this tongue is what is a fresh tongue now, my question to you is, the tongues you speak, are they fresh? Because if you keep getting filled with the Holy Spirit, your vocabulary in tongues will be changing. Because new vocabulary comes for every fresh impartation. And after two years, you will find out that the utterances you are declaring in tongues ay, is far removed from what it used to be those days. But just in case you are here and for five years you have only two syllables in your tongue. Jesus was not referring to you in Mark chapter 16 when he said that we speak in new tongues. It means you lack the technology of refreshing. And the Christianity that you have put on display in your life is a Christianity that has all the ailments of age. All the ailments of of antiquity it's not fresh and most of what you display as the virtues of your Christian faith are actually the history of the move of God in your life as I travel around the nation I see that the average believer lacks freshness it's as if we have come used to spiritual things like used to praying in tongues so when we say all right let's pray in tongues Pray now. Everybody, in that moment, for the five minutes that we raise the prayer, everybody saying something. It's as if we are all baptized in the Holy Spirit and we are fresh. Then once upon a time, while we were still on 
Venice State University campus. All the members of our church that were on campus, we felt a burden to invite everybody for prayer. Are you, are you still with me? The church I used to attend while I was on campus was supposed to be a Pentecostal church. Maybe. That's, it was classified as a Pentecostal church. But when we now came out of the congregation and we now gathered ourselves, say, let us pray. We'll take the scriptures to articulate the prayer point and to release it so that it lands on your soul and creates a body. And then the people pray for five, seven seconds. And even though the prayer, the person leading the prayer had not said, okay, let's take another prayer point. The prayer ended in the process. So if the coordinator wants to change the prayer point or not, he's on his own. That was the day I knew <laughs> that not all tongues are new. <laughs> ah, we raised another prayer point. Took scriptures. We mingled it. Mingled it. Mingled it. Mingled it. Added incense to it and released it. And when it was collected, it died down. Then I knew that we knew how to say some things in church. But they were not fresh tongue. And the average believer can get by operating on that level of technology. And he will, when they say, Christians, raise your hand up. He will also raise his hand that he is also. Meanwhile, his life is a contradiction from that which is expected to naturally result when we are in consistent communion with God. Whenever you see a man that doesn't have fresh tongue, it means he's stale and he lacks refreshing. He's not up to date with God. You must understand that. But he can still do some activities. He can still sing. He can still pray in tongues. But if you pray in tongues regularly, at least for one hour a day, you will get filled every day. And if you start living that way, getting filled every day, every day, in six months time, you yourself will be afraid of the progress you have made spiritually. It's easier to grow spiritually than naturally. Jesus had to train the apostles to give them the basic, basics of the Christian journey, the basics of the path of spiritual progress just for three and a half years. After three and a half years of discipleship, we should be able to isolate you from the congregational fellowship and take you to Zamfara and come after five years and see the impact that your life has created. If that technology of, of freshness, how to attain freshness, is not part of the discipline that the average believer incorporates into his life, then Christianity in this nation doesn't have a good destiny. They shall speak in fresh tongues. Utterances will be made under the influence of fresh releases from the spirit. People will be drunk regularly with the Holy Ghost. There are several situations you cannot go through and come out sane, except you are drunk. You need to take something. Hallelujah. You need to be intoxicated. If you need to go high, the Bible recommends that going high is not the problem, but the instrument by which you go high once and again, you need to go high, I tell you. We were doing crusades for a long time, and then a group of witches wrote a letter to us. And said, we were in peace. You guys came, started making noise around. To the extent that you boasted that you can cast us out from this environment. We saw your hand be that you are going to do a crusade. Let's meet there. Now, when you receive a message like that, all right, you need fresh tongues. You need to be drunk to be under an influence, intoxicated. Now, fresh tongues are the utterances that come when refreshing has come to you. Now, every time the, the apostles 
received a different, a new impartation in God by getting, when the God filled with the Holy Spirit, you will notice something, there were utterances. Are you with me? Not utterances that were premeditated, but utterances that, that came up fresh. It is that kind of utterance that comes out fresh, that has the capacity to, to, to live in a weary, a weary soul. Fresh stuff coming out. The Bible's these guys were threatened. They say they, they threatened them never to preach again. And the Bible said they came to their companions. The first thing they did was that they took some scriptures and raised the prayer point. And they stayed in the place of prayer until they were filled. They got drunk because when, when you are threatened, you need to be drunk. And right there, after getting drunk, the Bible said they speak, they, they began to declare the word of God with boon. That threat was intended to bridle their mouth to make them stop the preaching. That this your preaching is causing problems. You filled Jerusalem with your doctrine and they, they gave them some lashes and threatened them. Talk. The Bible said they came. There are sometimes in ministry you encounter something. Maybe one kind of darkness will rise up. The purpose of that rising up of darkness is to intimidate you so that your, your mouth can be preached. If you don't know how to receive refreshing and where to contact a fresh tongue, if you don't know how to get intoxicated, you will operate under that influence of intimidation and the devil will cut you out. We went for service in Kano while we were still um, on the orientation camp. There was a riot in town. And the news came to us on the when we gathered for morning parade, they say there was a riot in town and suddenly terror came into my spirit. Now you see, you know we are still human beings, you know. And sometimes you stumble on terror, on fear. There are some times that the devil can come and shout and then you, you become afraid. The fact that you were afraid is not the problem. But what did you do with your fear? That's the problem. Anytime fear grips you and it sustains, you need to get drunk. For, for 30 days on camp, because when we were on camp, those days we used to do camp for one month. I don't, you guys do camp one week or I don't know how long now. You just go out. <laughs> <you're> out. <laughs> I don't, we used to do camp for one month those days. For all those days, I never had the opportunity to be filled with the Holy Spirit. Do you understand? I did not have the opportunity for all those 30 days. Prayed prayers, but I did not... I did not have the opportunity to stretch to be filled. So I lived in that fear for 30 days. It's, it's a terror to live in anything other than faith for too long. That kind of fear can even bring liver problem. You don't understand it. A, a strange infirmity can come upon you just because you spent some days, some months in fear, in terror. So when I came out of the camp, I told my friends, I need a place to pray. So they now said, there's one mountain somewhere. So I went up. And because of the fact that I have not been filled for a long time, it took me three hours to be filled with the Holy Ghost. And when I became filled, I shouted. And I, 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 I called Satan. I said, Kai, come. See, that time that man is drunk. It's not normal. He's saying all kinds of things that time. There's an influence. If you don't know how to get high, you will die quickly. So I see a Christianity that we have accepted in our time that has the Holy Ghost, but it, it does not have what? Fire. That's counterfeit. Because if you continue working with God, he will start consuming you. He will possess your soul. There will be nothing else that you desire other than him. You, you, sometimes you want to sleep. You don't feel it. You feel it's a sin for you to sleep now. Because of the urgency of that which you feel. That is fire. It's burning your soul. It's, it's, you, people might, that is a proof of spiritual health. When you start becoming too normal, you are, you are abnormal. 
Three hours of prayer and I was back. My spiritual muscles responded again. And the warrior that I used to be, I was refreshed in that re reality. A time can come when, you know those days when Israel, some people were, they were, they were besieged. Have you ever read that Israel was besieged? An entire city was besieged. So that there's no, there's no traffic. Nobody comes in. Nobody goes out. That's what the devil wants to do to you. When he comes and he rouses, Besieges you. And many people remain there and still keep speaking church language. When last did you rebel against the devil? I got filled with the Holy Ghost. You see, in order for the devil to compound my case, they stole my meal ticket while I was on camp. I ate from the dining only for seven days. They stole my meal ticket. The meal ticket was supposed to guarantee 30 days of food. But I only enjoyed seven and they stole it. When you get to camp, they give you khaki. I never wore my khaki till I graduated. Because as I was receiving it, they stole it. All of those things were acts of terror. Orchestrated by the kingdom of darkness. To make me besieged. But in the eighth month of my youth service, we were holding a, a service, a, a mighty service. And witches came for the service too. Because we invited everybody, which is also on the invitation. As we were holding that service, the hand of God broke out and one witch was arrested. She confessed that they were the one that orchestrated for my khaki to disappear. She, she doesn't know me, but we, have, we met only a few weeks ago. She spoke about my khaki that they took and my meal ticket. Then I knew that it was an attempt to be besieged. But when you know and you have the technology of receiving fresh tongues, you rebel against the devil. They shall speak in fresh tongue. Turn with me to Ephesians chapter 5 as we progress. I, will, I, I want you today to be angry at that normal Christianity. It, is, it has all the symptoms of besiegement. She confessed and said, they knew me from Benway State. Yeah? You know me? Where? Ha, ha, ha. That was it was a strange day. That we know you from Benue State. Me, hey. he said God used you to destroy our kingdom in Benue State, and our people came from River Benue to at this side to inform us that if you don't stop him, he will destroy the landscape. They even knew me more than myself. <laughs> oh, la makaya. You see, sometimes the devil brings some kind of problems to you. It has your length, your breadth, your waist size. Hey, you don't understand it. <laughs> you know, a tailor can't make your trouser until he uses tape. <laughs> it was measured. They measured you. It, the thing fits you. He knows where to touch to blank you out. But if you can decide to, to, to get filled... And your utterance becomes fresh. You can rebel. Amen. Don't stay in that mode. He wants you to stay. And then you are in, in this, this reoccurring situation of pity party. You want everybody to pity you, pity you. That is an abnormally. It's an abnormally. Jesus said in the kingdom that violence is allowed. To be radical is allowed. It's not a crime. That's what he said. It's not a crime. But it's an option. You can decide not to adopt the formula of violence. If you can survive that way, it's okay. But violence is what? It's allowed. My crisis that time had my trouser measurement. Took my khaki, took my meal ticket. And I was low on cash. So what's the meaning? Fast all the way. 
but I was fasting for what I did not know. And there was fear in my heart because I could not blow up. And it was like that for 30 days. But eight months later, I saw the impact of rebelling against the devil. The Bible said, be not drunk with wine, wherein is excess. That it is, it, it, it is true that you need to go high. But the instrumentality with which you go high is what is in question now. He said, there's no need for wine. I know there's need to be high, but not with wine. If you need to go high, go high by the Spirit. And the Bible reveals that when that freshness comes, there's, there are always utterances. He said, be filled with the Spirit speaking. There, there are utterances, fresh utterances, powerful utterances. You can, see, when you are fresh, you can just take your Bible and read, and somebody's. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. You just read. The, I went somewhere to preach and I just took eight verses of the Bible and I read it and somebody said, Hallelujah! I said, what? <laughs> Could I say? It was fresh. <laughs> Same scripture. The lady began to confess, we know you from Ben. And our leader told us that if we allow you, you will destroy our kingdom. So I have that power. He said that I tried three times to kill you. I said, oh, you tried to? When we came to your room, you were lying in a pool of fire and there were two fluorescent lights by your side. I knew those were angels. You know, that's how they are. I've seen them before. Two fluorescent beings that are like fluorescent lights. There. The third time when I came, they almost killed me. That's why I didn't come again. I said, ah. You went too quick. Confessing all kinds of stuff like that. After she was publicly disgraced, that's when they sent us later. Now we were living in peace before you came. Now you have come to cause problem. We heard you are doing crusade. We are coming. Let's meet on the field. When you hear that one, it's a threat. The, the reason why they sent the message is so that you can be threatened. Anything that makes you small, makes you afraid, makes you confused is an attack on your anointing. You don't understand it. It's an attack on your anointing. And when your anointing is attacked, it means that thrones are fighting. Thrones. It's an attack. And the attack is in second place overhead. Is if you accept that threat, you have accepted containment and confinement. What happens when they put a handcuffs on people? You have accepted. I went to the mountain top again. And this time I did not eat for seven days. I was filled and filled and filled and filled again. I came to the crusade ground drunk. I was tired. Weak but drunk. My cantebolo. When last were you drunk? And you spoke in tongues. You didn't care how you were looking. If you are still conscious of the configuration of the lipstick, you are not filled yet. The alignment. How the lipstick is resting. If that consciousness is still there, you are still in the flesh. Came to the crusade ground, preached the gospel message, gave through in the, the altar call. 500 and some people came to give their life to Christ. And instead of me to lead them to Christ, I say fire. I did not say it. The thing came out of my mouth. Just fire. How will people come to receive Jesus and then you say fire? That's, is, that's madness. Meanwhile, when I said fire, 100 people and above began to manifest. So the witches joined them. They don't want to give their life to Christ, but they joined that. This is the time that we can go closer to him. He had been making noise from afar. Now, when they gave other call, about 200 of them entered and said, and then when they came close, I didn't know when he came out, what? 
But 110 people on the field came under the influence of that power and began to manifest. We forgot about the people we, we had to lead to Christ. We plundered. Oh, yeah, come. We did deliverance from 8 in the night to 11 in the night. Then I bent down like this. I knew I was almost dead because my flesh, no strength. From 7 days of fasting, then deliverance from 8 to 11. People vomited things. People, some people ran away. We had to chase them. At all kinds of things. Then one guy said, we are pushing people. We are pushing people. That let them come and lay hand on him. We now brought a small boy. We raised him up. He took his hand and put the person fell into the... <laughs> we raised him. We said, no. We raised small... <laughs> From that day, those witches parked from that place. And indeed, their kingdom was destroyed. They shall speak with fresh tongue. One of the ways that the Bible reveals that we can check our spiritual health is the freshness of your utterance. When your utterance begins to become stale, speaking it doesn't generate that which looks like life. You are becoming old. So freshness comes when we get filled with the Holy Spirit. And every time we get filled with the Holy Spirit, there are utterances that are released. The Bible also reveals that only people that are refreshed can refresh others. Just in case you preach... You stand before people to declare the gospel. Hallelujah. Before you come there, get filled first. When you get filled and you come and you are speaking, you might even say something you have said some time ago, but it will be traveling with a different power, backing it up. When it hits people's heart, it, it diffuses and power comes upon them. So it's not about saying new things. It's about saying things that are quickened. Things that have been made alive by the Spirit. Because only a man that is refreshed can refresh others. All through scriptures you find Paul saluting people and say, Oh, that guy refreshed my spirit. So even great apostle Paul, there were times he was discouraged. And somebody just stood by talking to him, talking to him, talking to him. And instantly refreshing. The same thing happening to his, that man's spirit began to happen to Paul's spirit. And he said, refresh me in the spirit. The Bible spoke about David. That when David came with his harp and began to play before Saul, two things happened. The first thing that happened was that the demon that oppressed Saul left. And second thing that happened, Saul was refreshed. What kind of men are these that have the power to change the spiritual climate? What kind of men are these? Wakes up in the morning and just is singing in the compound. The entire compound comes under the influence of the spiritual stirring that they are projecting. That's a power uh, uh, coming out of a man's spirit that has experienced refreshing in the presence of God. And so Peter said, times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Father. Hallelujah. So refreshing it's a possibility in our spiritual life. And it is something that we must have access to every day. You get it? Every day. You might see me lying down on the bed and I'm not talking. What you don't know that I'm doing is inside of me, there's a service going on. You see, I've been in the business of praying in tongues for years. Now I have a different experience now. I just wake up from sleep. Alright? And I'm on my bed now. And I can be there for two hours. There's a service. I'm on a bike. There's a service going on. I'm in the office. There's a service going on. I'm hearing songs. If I must sing at all, I sing those songs I'm hearing inside. Hallelujah. And as I sing them, it diffuses mighty power inside of me. I just, I'm just there, just enjoying myself. You might not know that enough spiritual activity is going on on, the, on my inside. You may not know. 
Because I will not be loud enough to distract you. I will not be doing my own business. Because I understand how God comes to minister refreshing to us. I understand the movements of God. I understand I can design the power of the inner life. I moves to renew us, to revive us and to refresh us. I have understood it over the years. That thing you called me and you told me that was happening to you. I've lived in that realm for 12 years. I've lived there for 12 years. Hallelujah. And the more and more, the spiritual becomes more real to you than the natural. More and more, you can access spiritual resources such that even if the devil cuts off natural resources, you will still be sustained because you have access to the supply of heaven. I was with mommy, we were somewhere on Friday and she said, have you noticed that there will be famine because all the farms are flooded, all kinds of stuff. There's natural famine here. So we need to learn how to access spiritual food. So that if, if the supplies are cut off, we have access to the supply of heaven. I know you don't believe that. See, there are times where I, I was not fasting, but I've stayed days without food. Not because I was fasting. I didn't feel hungry. Well, let me, let me stop there. Hallelujah. There was no hunger. I've seen the power of God that quickens your mortal body. And you don't have need for food. Not because you are fasting. And there's strength in your body. Not because you took a drug that will make up for. More and more. The, rea the realities of the Holy Spirit. The realities of the realm of God. We are stepping into it. Learning how to walk in it and how to handle it. That is the realm of our reality in the new creation. And the more we get acquainted and the more we get galvanized in it, the more we operate like Jesus. Hallelujah. Revelation chapter 22. So we have seen spiritual food. We have seen spiritual refreshing. One thing I found out also in the spirit realm is that in the spirit realm, there's a river. I know you have gone to River Benue. You have seen River Benue. Hallelujah. And the day River Benue becomes angry, it can dispossess people of their houses and dwellings. All right? You can be staying close to the river bank for 12 years, and you and the river have no quarrel. And then in the 13th year, the river becomes angry and dispossesses you of your dwelling. And when it's coming to dispossess you, you don't quarrel with it. What you do is you pack your foam. <laughs> the river is something that has its own will. You can even decide to make a channel for it and to allow it to go with its problem. All right? That means you acknowledge that he has his own will. So you gave him a right of way, passage. Just in case you don't make elaborate plans for the river, it can dispossess you of your accommodation. John was taken to heaven. He was given a rare privilege to walk around heaven and to reveal to us the articles that make up that reality. We would like to draw from his testimony in the book of Revelation chapter 22. If you were not here yesterday, get the tape. Even if you were here, get it. In John, Revelation chapter 22, turn with me. Verse 1, the Bible says, And he showed me a pure river of water of life, clear as crystal, proceeding out 
of the throne of God and of the Lamb. In the midst of the street of it, and on either side of the river, there the tree of life, which bare twelve manner of fruits, and yielded a fruit every month, and the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. I know you have seen something else that I, I didn't plan that you will see now. Yes, you have seen that there's a river in heaven. You have also seen that the tree of life is in heaven. The tree of life that was in the garden of Eden. Hallelujah. That tree of life. On the account of the error of Adam, it was transplanted. Taken to another place. Hallelujah. The potential of that tree was stated. That it has the capacity of bearing different kinds of fruits every month. That's not a kind of tree that we can figure into the natural. Amen. So one of the things we are going to see that is part of the spiritual. Is the tree of life. We must know how to access the 12 fruits that it brings. If there are still 12 months in the calendar year, then you must be feeding from one fruit, one different fruit each month for the whole year. The Bible says that after Jesus fed the multitude with bread and fish, there were 12 baskets that were gathered when the fragments were put together. 12 baskets, each one basket per month. But my emphasis is not the tree of life yet. We need to do a lot, a lot of study to understand those 12 fruits. Because anything you see in heaven, please, are you still with me? Anything you see in heaven, they are, they are not realities that, are, that we need to die before we experience. Those are realities that are accessible in Christ. We can, we can function in heaven. God, see, our citizenship is of heaven. We are seated with Christ in heavenly realms far above principalities and powers. So these resources are now resources. You should be able to access them now. Function in them now. You don't need to die before you go to heaven. Heaven is supposed to be a reality that you are trading, doing business with. So that the day your life on earth comes to an end, you just enter into a reality that you are familiar with. It's not something that Let's wait. By and by. When the morning comes. Oh, we used to sing those songs those days. When the oh. We shall tell the story. How we overcome. No story now. But by and by. We shall understand the better. Friends, there's understanding for you today. It's available. That's why the Spirit of God came. We have received the Spirit which is not of this world, but the Spirit which is of God that we may know the things freely given to us. So anything you see in heaven is something that we are supposed to be interacting with. And if there's a tree of life there, God wants us to interact with that tree of life now. It's a provision. It's a resource. It's a possibility. Something that is accessible. Christianity is not beggarly. It's a journey into God. And because God is endless, that journey never ends. Don't wait and say bye and bye. No, faith is never tomorrow. Faith is now. Because that's how eternity works. Eternity is not, is not time-based. It is faith-based. Do you understand it? Faith-based, non-based. Because it is faith-based. So there's no need for you to wait for a bye and bye. The Bible says while... While Stephen was about to be stoned to death, the heavens were open. He saw Jesus standing. Did he die before he saw him? He was still alive. That means you can see Jesus now. It's possible. If Elijah called down fire from heaven, it's still possible to call it down today. Don't always interpret that he caused spiritual fire. No, he called physical fire. People were burnt off. Because there are some people that have operated in that realm now. I heard that Babalola went to a village to preach and he challenged all the witches that they should gather at the witchcraft tree of the village. 
By 12 noon. Then he gave the witches one hour. Try to kill me. Then he sat down. I was singing Sunday school song. He said, for one hour, try to kill me, all of you. Gather and kill me. After one hour, and the witches could not kill him. When he rose up, he cried in the name of Jesus, and literal balls of fire came down and consumed the witchcraft tree. Then a picture was taken of the tree burning, and we were told that that fire was not kindled by matches. It was kindled by prayer. When fire consumed the tree, all the witches had to beg for their lives. They had to beg. A man that can invoke. It is still possible to. I don't know. Anything they did, they did because they had access to a dimension in God. And those were the manifestations from that realm. Don't consider it impossible, unthinkable. No! So if there's a tree of life in heaven. Standing side by side of the river of life. God wants us to access one fruit each month. I don't, we'll not go there now. The Bible says, this is John. He was on a guided tour through heaven. In the corner side of heaven, he testified that he saw a river. And the difference between that river and the river, and river Benway is that that river is as clear as crystal. Now, I don't know, I don't know. Um, is maybe our sisters can give us insight into what crystal is because you wear all kinds of stuff these days. You, oh, sometimes you don't know the color. Wear all kinds of things. And so we need a testimony now as to how is crystal? Because I don't want to use chemistry. Crystal from the part. Is, is that one right? Ice block. Thank you. Ice block. Something that is, is transparent, is clear, doesn't lack in, 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 no impurity, nothing. It's as if it's as if you can see through it as though nothing was there, but you know there's water. John saw that. Let's go on. Psalms, turn with me. Spiritual things. They exist in the environment. In the domain of a spirit being. Psalms 46. If, if after attending this conference, your spiritual life is still dry, you fade. You must understand one thing. The only reason why you are alive here is to fulfill the purpose of God for your life. Nothing else. The life is not even so sweet though, that anybody will want to stay forever. Maybe you want to stay forever. I don't know. Because the little times I interacted with God and had open fellowship with him, I knew that there was a dimension that was better than this existence. In the book of Psalms 46, Please follow my reading from verse 1. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore, will not we fear, though the earth be removed, and though the mountains be carried into the midst of the sea, though the waters thereof roar and be troubled, though the mountains shake with the swelling thereof, Selah, there is a river. The streams whereof make glad the city of God, the holy place of the tabernacles of the Most High. This is David. David was saying the same thing that John saw in the book of Revelation and David was saying it by the spirit of prophecy. Now, you see, I would like us to Focus more on this scripture. Can we do that now? Let's focus. First of all, David began to speak about natural things. How that God is our refuge. How that God is a present help in the time of trouble. 
David gave us a revelation of God in the present tense. A God that is in the midst of your trouble. It's not a holiday God. Every time you pass through trouble, David wants you to understand that God was actually in it with you. Mm. I know of a woman, she had an only son. She had uh, three daughters and just and one boy. And she loved the boy so bad. Hallelujah. Loved him so bad. Spoiled him as much as she could do. And when the guy uh, was in foot mina. Amen. Made sure that all his provisions were in place. So much money. The guy now became a member of a court. Member of black ass court. And when the opposition court saw that Black Axe had all the money, had everything, had all the resources, and were commanding the territory, the opposition court group went spiritual. They went to contact power. Say, okay, you can win on the ground, but we'll win from on top, from the spirit. Hallelujah. Suddenly, this young man complained of headache in the classroom. Headache, headache, headache. And he died there. That was how they brought him to the village for burial. From the day they buried that young man, the mother started becoming sick. Half of her body became paralyzed months later, and she eventually died. It was obvious that her death was as a result of the death of the son. That's what happens to people without shock absorbers. A man that is in God goes through the same kind of sorrow, but he comes out, he's not paralyzed. You don't know that it was not normal. That God in your spirit created capacity for you to be able to bear that situation, but you could not perceive that God was in it. And he was the one that gave you the shock of to have the capacity to pass through deadly stuff, but you still come out untouched. That's a testimony that he's not a holiday God. He's a God that is in your trouble right when you are in that trouble. If you, your eyes can be opened to understand what it means to be supernatural. You are not with me. When we say God is supernatural. It means when we say God is supernatural. You see. If we had said super spiritual, maybe we would have understood that. Super spiritual would have meant that God doesn't need a vessel through which he will function. Right? He functions independent of vessels. Independent of men. He just comes through lightning and thunder. Doesn't need to come through a man. But that's not how God intends to move. God moves through his vessels. He moves in his vessels so that they can move through his vessels. Alright? You cannot comfort somebody if you yourself have not received comfort from the Lord. The Bible says he comforts us in all our troubles so that we can comfort others with the comfort we ourselves have received from God. So he's inside of you administering comfort when you are passing through situations that are contrary. But you may not know because you do not understand the scope and the reality of the supernatural. How God most powerful can bring support to a man that is not too powerful. The way he does it is that he releases grace in capsules, in measures. Equivalent to your level of weakness. So that if your eyes are not open to know that it's God that is working it. You may not even know. You may not acknowledge him and give him thanks. He's working with you in the problem, supplying enough strength so that you can bear it and pass through it. 
and survive it and there are people that had the same circumstances that could not survive and it doesn't occur to you that there was a supernatural element that was giving you back up david said that god is our very present help not run away but in the midst of it he doesn't live now so those are two things now he said God is our refuge and strength, our covering and our empowerment. And we find this covering and empowerment on display when we are in trouble. He covers us so that the will of the devil is not performed. Have you read the scripture that says we have we are this treasure in eighteen vessels that the excellency of the power might be of God and not of us? Many times the devil comes and his intention is to crush us. God allows him in a measure. And he gives us a blow, expecting that he will scatter. But the result of his blow, he doesn't see it. We are cast down, not forsaken. We are pressed, not destroyed. It's as if the devil cannot locate our elastic limit because of the deposit of the Spirit of God that operates on our inside. The will of the devil is never fulfilled, even though he brings pressure upon us. With Christ in you, even the burden of mortality is a light thing to bear. He's a present help in the time of trouble. That's the second understanding. Then, David now says, because we understand this, we, we shall not fear. Even though the earth be removed, even though the mountains are carried and deposited in the midst of the sea, he's saying even though strange things happen, that come on. Because we are sure of God's present help in the midst of trouble. Because we are sure of God strengthening us and of God being a cover to us. Even if strange things happen, we will not fear. Then he gives us an insight into the spiritual environment that works for our good. That establishes the purpose of God in our lives. He now said, there is. Now, see, that man has left the plane of the earth just to protest, to protest his fault point that god is a present help god is our refuge that god is our strength then he takes us deeper and says there is a river the same river that john captured told us about in the book of revelation he said there is a river now if that river were physical he wouldn't have had to say there's a river we know there's a river river ben we have river ben here River Niger is flooded, we know. But he spoke about God being our refuge. He spoke about God being our, our strength. He spoke about God being a present help in the midst of trouble before he now spoke about a river. He said that that river is what makes heaven a place of gladness. Somebody sent me a text and said, do you believe the testimony of people that had near-death experiences? You know, we have all kinds of scientists. We have all kinds of people here. As you are they are looking humble now. The question they asked me, oh my God. Some of them are synthesized from the laboratory. Some, some of the questions are synthesized. Synthesized questions. Hallelujah. Say, do you believe in the testimony of people that had near-death experiences? And it depends on a particular testimony, actually. Amen? But I went to visit my father-in-law, and he took me to their church in Ife. And uh, a preacher was preaching. He's a lecturer that was allowed to preach that Sunday morning. He told us about his own experience. He experienced, he died. Hallelujah. And then he was telling us what happened. And I was sitting with my mother-in-law here. And then when he says, this thing happened, I will quote the scripture. He said, that one happened, I quote. Then he said, he, he, ah, no, I don't want to trouble you with it. It's a long story. Uh, my answer to that question is that if the near-death experience that the person is speaking about tallies with this book, it is true. Amen? Amen? I told you yesterday that I have been given the privilege to be taken by a hand of a tall guide through heaven. 
it took place in eight hours on the 20th of october 2003 i was taken to heaven for eight hours the things i know in the bible i saw them physically there are you with me this book is a book of testimony bearing the testimony of a reality that is unending on unending and by the message of god and the privileges of his grace i have seen a little david now begins to testify to us and say there is a river so the streams wear off make glad the city of god one thing you will notice when you walk into heaven is there's something in that place that gives it a spark it gives it, it the atmosphere is full of not just life but there's something that makes people joyful I'm about a kind of joy that you can have because you had a promotion. I'm talking about a joy that has its roots in spiritual activity. It's a joy that the Bible calls passes all understanding. You don't know why. Because its roots is not attached to anything that is natural. It has gone beyond that which you can comprehend the source. It has its roots in God. Every time the Bible mentions joy, it is always in accompaniment with the presence of God. The only possibility of stumbling on joy is in the presence of God. The Bible says, "In Thou will show us the path to life. In thy presence is what? Fullness of now we, joy. But the Bible revealed that the reason why the citizens of that country are always glad is because of the river. That means if this river is flowing inside of you, you will look back to when you were discouraged and you will not find any time. Somebody came to me and said, do you ever feel discouraged? I said, well, that's an experience that I cannot recall the last time I had. Because I think it's about 15 years or so that I was discouraged. You see, we don't get encouraged because there's um, money in the bank account. I assure you there are many more times where there's no money. Many times. When there's nothing. But you see, the tempo, the morale does not ch change. I was counseling with a, a lady and she said, you know my problem? I have mood swings. Somebody said mood swings, mood swing. Now, you can have mood swings when you don't know this river. It means that the vibrations of your soul is what determines your comportment and your template. That means you are a sorry state. You will bring problems to anybody you are close to. You afflict them with swings. Just in case you are, you are, you are haunted by mood swings, don't go into a relationship. You don't qualify. You bring problem, trouble to people. Keep tr the trouble for yourself and learn how to master it. In Jesus' name. The Bible says there is a river. The streams of that river, the flow of that river guarantees gladness, joy. That means God has his own joy mechanism that is attached to physical events. Since the supply and the root of this joy is spiritual in nature, you can have it independent of circumstances and situations. And that will be a proof of the fact that you know the river that John saw. Amen. When you visit a believer, and once and again you find them in depression, find them in confusion, find them under the plague of anxiety, and that is becoming a constant aspect of their lives, that believer is abnormal. No, I'm just, just if, I, you know I didn't mention any, anybody's name. And I don't even know your condition. I'm just preaching, if that is you, you are abnormal. There is a river. 
I said spiritual realities, uh, spiritual things are realities that exist where? In the domain of a spiritual being. It's the spirit of God that carries them around. Do you, do you get it? I said, are you still with me? Yes, so one of the things he carries around is a river. In the book of John chapter 7, Jesus rose up on the last day of the feast to make a proclamation. Hallelujah. He waited for so many days. In fact, he did not arrive at the place of the feast early. People were, were disturbing him to make himself known. Now the feast has come. Let everybody know that you are a miracle worker. I say, my time has not yet come. For you guys, your time is every time. But for me, I wait for my stipulated time from the Father before I move. So they left him at home when they went for the feast. And when they got to the feast, everybody was murmuring and saying, where is this man? Where, just this man in the countryside. He will come to, to Galilee and cause commotion. Drive out devils, heal the blind. Now it's a feast time. Everybody from all the parts of Israel have come around and this man is not around. What is happening? The first day of the feast finished. Second day, third day, everybody was getting fed up. And on the last day, when their, their weariness and leanness and thirst for God was on the increase, Jesus stood on a platform and said, He that is thirsty. I, I like his appearance that day. He waited for the time when there was need. Let him come. And he that believeth on me, as the scriptures have said, out of his belly shall flow. No man spoke like that. Now, let me show you something. I know you, you, you didn't see this one. Genesis chapter 2. In Genesis chapter 2, turn with me. Now let's see verse 10. And a river went out of Eden. How many rivers? One, ba? All right. A river went out of Eden to water the garden. And from thence it parted. It was parted and became into four heads. So it branched out into four heads. The name of the first one is Pishon. That is it which encompasses the whole land of Havilah. Where there is gold. And the gold of that land is good. There is. Belinium. And, and the onyx stone. The name of the second. Is Gihon. The same is that. Compassed the whole land of Ethiopia. Let me stop here. This is the law of first mention. This is the first time a river was mentioned in the Bible. And in Bible study, the law of first mention is consistent in establishing doctrine. The first time a thing is mentioned in scripture, the scope and the perspective and the context of that thing is established. The Bible is like a stream. If God, the whole gospel, we can preach it from Genesis. Everything in the Bible has, is articulated in Genesis. Just like every nerve in the body flows through the legs. What happened in subsequent books is that things that were seeds in the book of Genesis were now developed into mighty rivers in subsequent books. But it's the same stuff. Do you understand what I'm talking about? Good. So that is on the basis of that that we have the principle and the law of first mention. This is the first time a river is mentioned. Now, the purpose of the river mentioned here is not... The first purpose of the river mentioned here is that the river is actually... Item. The flow of the river actually erodes the ground and unveils the treasure that is in the soil. That's the context here. Because rivers were mentioned in accordance with the resources on the ground. 
Oh my God, you're not with me. Why would they, what, what, he said, peace on. This is that which flows through the region of Havila, where there is gold. Now, what has the river got to do with the treasure there? Nobody knew there was gold there until Pishon, until that river branched into four heads. There was never a discovery of what was in those separate regions. It's the flow of the river as it branched out that began to erode the ground and to unveil the treasure on the inside. Are you still here? Now, Jesus said, He that believeth on me, as the scriptures have said, out of his belly shall flow rivers. You may not understand that now that you are born again, there are treasures of God that are hidden inside of you. And the reason why you need to consistently allow the rivers flow is that when the rivers are flowing, are flowing, are flowing, are flowing, are flowing, a time will come where it will begin to reveal the treasures buried inside of your spirit. If you find a man that doesn't allow the river flow for too long, his gifts from God will never be made manifest. Not because God did not give him gifts. No river to reveal it. I know of a sister that joined us not too long. And she was wondering, wow. Hey, everybody's strong spiritually and all of that. Say, don't worry. Before six months, you will see that the same thing will start happening to you if you can keep pace keep pace with the process she gave herself to prayer gave herself to fasting consistently like that over a space of four five months the river began to unveil stuff suddenly she now began to understand her calling suddenly she began to understand the voice of god suddenly she now found out that actually she had the gifts of a prophet suddenly strange things began to happen and the understanding she had of herself had been changing consistently for the past six, seven months. Only the river can unveil the treasure. I never knew I was an apostle. I never knew that. I thought I was just a Bible teacher. Called, I know I have a teaching ministry. That one will never leave me. So I used to call myself teacher. And I went and allowed the river flow. Hallelujah. And God said, young man, <laughs> I have called you to be an apostle. In fact, a special messenger. Oh. I never knew that. For many years, I thought I was just a teacher. Because if I were a teacher, my assignment would be just to teach you and go. But the fact that I'm not a teacher puts an added responsibility upon me. My work, my assignment is not just to teach you. After teaching you, the reality of that which is in the scriptures, I should be able to impart it upon you. Because with the apostolic is impartation. If there is somebody that claims to be an apostle and doesn't have the capacity for impartation, it's not. God empowers every apostle with the ability to impart the spiritual dimension of the things he teaches. A teacher needs a revelation to preach to you, but an apostle is, is a revelation himself. He has gone through spiritual processes, spiritual corridors, spiritual dimensions. And if he says, if he speaks John 3, 16. Okay. Can we pick John 3, 16? He is not by the... <laughs> Can we digress? If you give me five minutes, let's digress and go to John 3, 16. We might need four or five days to finish it. Not because I study too much. That's not the truth. Because God takes an apostle into the spirit realm. And he allows him to see the spiritual things that the Bible testifies about from that realm. When he comes to talk about it with scripture, it's as if he wrote it himself. Do you understand it? That was the anointing that was operating in the early apostles and prophets. That made them lay foundation. For us to walk upon today. There is a touch of originality. That travels with the apostolic ministry. And when you make contact with it. You know you have touched an original thing in God. That body. Is far more grievous. Than that which a teacher carries. 
But I, I, I was I operated in the office of a teacher for 12 years. Going for conferences and teaching in meetings, they will give me team, team of the conference, the team. Then I look for scriptures. Hallelujah. Then I realize that the church needs more than teams. In fact, a teacher will not have what to teach except it's aligned with an apostle that is current. Because new things begin in the body of Christ from the apostolic office. When those new things begin to find expression, that's when teachers have what to teach. A teacher needs to be aligned with the ministry of an apostle accurately in order for him to be current with the... Okay, let me stop. Amen? Are you still with me now? If not, the teacher will be teaching something that is old stock. God has moved from that point and he doesn't know what God is doing now, but he's still teaching. Do you understand it? The office of the teacher will be relevant if it is aligned with current apostolic technology. If not, he will be establishing something that is a deviation from God's current emphasis. Do you understand what I'm talking about? Well, some other time we'll talk about the coordination between the fivefold offices. Then we'll see the hidden place of the evangelist in the body of Christ. And what happens to a generation when the voice of the evangelist is cut off. Then you understand the differences. Why they are called offices? Why are they called offices? While I fellowship with God and move with God, God now spoke to me and said, you are not a teacher. You have a teaching ministry, but you are called to be an apostle. It changed my life. God told me after he gave me that insight that I should go and study the life of Paul, the things he teached. He's, he's teaching his life, his miracles. That is how I'm going to be. That there are different kinds of apostles. That Peter was an evangelistic apostle. He was an apostle that had a bias in the evangelistic ministry. Paul was an apostle that had a teaching ministry. John was an apostle that had a prophetic ministry. And these were the special messengers of the new covenant. And he told me that my ministry is like Paul. An apostle that has a teaching ministry. So that saints could be established among all nations. And obedience to Christ among all people can become a reality. That's why Paul was called. And that was the burden that was attached to his apostolic ministry that had a teaching emphasis. Do you understand what I'm talking about? He was called to establish obedience to Christ among all nations. So we should be able to preserve the gospel against deception that is seeking to wipe away the true gospel from the earth. That's why I feel a strong burden in this day and time when biblical truth has been watered down and another gospel has been initiated. It places a strong demand upon my life because I was called to preserve the truth of Christ and his kingdom. Do you understand it? I may not know the other, the, the imports of the other dimensions of the apostolic, but me, I understand the one I'm called to. And God began to give me more insight. Then I now discovered that with understanding is manifestation. You cannot manifest something that you don't understand. That's where I find out. God will bring you to a point of understanding first before he ushers you into the corridors of manifestation. You cannot raise the dead if you don't understand the technology. Even if you do it, it will be by mistake. It will not be consistent in your ministry. God will reveal the technology to you in the spirit. You understand it in that sphere. Then it will become your own. The Bible says, there is a river. The streams whereof make glad the city of God. That river is what erodes you and brings the revelation of who you are on display. How much of yourself do you know in God? The Bible says we are his workmanship recreated in Christ Jesus to do the things that we were foreordained to do. So that means your purpose was captured in Christ. Alright? How much of it do you know? How much of your life do you know in, in God? You know that you need a car, you need business, you need a job, but you don't know about you in God. 
and you don't understand that in the kingdom is when you understand who you are and you commit yourself to the fulfillment of that which God has ordained you to be that you can succeed in anything. That's your own path to success. That is your own unique path to success. If I'm going to succeed in life, I must stay on the pulpit and I must teach about Jesus Christ. That's my own path. It may not be your path, but that's my own path. That's what guarantees that I excel. That is the basis. That is what I stand upon that God makes physical supplies to me and my family. That's how it works in the kingdom. In the world, you can steal money and be, 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 be provided for. But that's not how it works in the kingdom. In the kingdom, you find who you are in God, the purpose of God for your life, and you stand there. Now, there's, because of the anointing that is available in the house, we can decide that what we'll be doing is praying for the sick and releasing miracles. Meeting people's needs. And we'll call that ministry. The truth of the matter is, if I use the anointing to meet your need, you will still have a need tomorrow. But if by the anointing I can bring you into your purpose, your purpose meets your need consistently. Now, once and again, we'll pray for the sick and use the prophetic oil to minister to people to help them out of situations and circumstances, but that is not our ministry. That's a good thing to do, and we do that. But what we are called to do is to bring you into your purpose where your needs are met consistently. If you have not found your purpose, you are a, you are a wanderer. If we help you, the help will still make you more hungry. If you found out that instructions from God are no longer coming into your life, the river is not flowing anymore. If there are no recurring instructions, if you are not receiving new callings, new callings, do you know what I mean by new callings? At first, God told me, the first instruction God gave me about 18 years ago, he said, teach. I'm 27 years old in Christianity now. 18 years ago, the Lord spoke to me, said, teach now. So I began to teach from that time. That was an instruction. Are you with me? Began to teach. Then God came again and said, truth is falling in the street. Righteousness can no longer enter. He said, open your eyes and look at the body of Christ. I will show you what is wrong. Then teach on those things. The first was what? Teach. That means if I find John 3.16, I teach it. I chose. Then he now came and said, see, you are trying. But now, I will open your eyes to see the things that are not in place in the body of Christ. Then teach those things. Supply that need. Hallelujah. That's an additional calling. That's an additional responsibility that is higher than teach now. You get it? Or you don't get it? Then another point he came again in 2009. He said, I will open the gates of nations to you. Prepare bread for the nations. Are you following? So I said, all right. That was when I started studying about nations. Malawi. What's their population? What's the uh, Muslim population, Christian population? Botswana, their exchange rate. Nigeria and the Botswana money. Uh, uh, Nigerian, Naira, Kenyan shillings. I started studying all kinds of stuff about these nations. The kind of, what is their, the quality of their Christianity. I found out that Uganda and Nigeria has the best level of Christianity in Africa. That if Uganda and Nigeria are the places you can consider that at least a small revival is here existing, you can now imagine what's going on in Ghana. So the scope of the call increased. The scope of emphasis has increased. It is when the river is flowing consistently that you begin to receive new callings, new scopes, new perspectives and god begins to increase your capacity with every insight he gives you every instruction he gives you but it's the river that reveals the treasure now boniface is here he ministers he came one night i 
was invited to go and minister somewhere. Hallelujah. When the young, when he came, deaf people were hearing in that place. Yes, he has a calling as a worship leader. Do you understand it? But anytime there's a new calling revealed, there's a new grace that comes upon you. So that you will know where you are going to disburse this grace. The first mention of river had to do with his ability to unveil things that are submerged. There is a river. How much of those things that God has hidden inside of you have to realize? Now come with me. Let me round up. So that we can close. Amen? I say amen, oh! Amen. There is a river. Isaiah chapter 44 verse 3 then I close this night. Isaiah 44 verse 3 I close this night. There is a river. The streams whereof make glad the city of God. I remember when my dad died and I came home from school and I saw women mourning and my mother was in the midst of them I just came back from seven days of fasting I was possessed with the Holy Spirit hallelujah till today I have not wept for my father's death for 11 years I have not wept I didn't feel any sense of loss at all and I, I, I'm the last son. They say, okay, when you are going to the graveside, you will cry. You have tried so far, but at the graveside, there's a mechanism that releases tears involuntarily. So for 11 years, I'm... When I came to the room where the women... We began to pray. When we began to pray, the spirit of prophecy came upon me and I started prophesying. You will not believe sorrow died that day. You know, morning sorrow, it left. If you, anybody that cried, it was fake. <laughs> sorrow left. I came back from seven days of fasting from the mountain. Only to see that my house. So, friends, there is a river. The streams whereof make glad the city of God. Anywhere that river flows into, it takes away the burden of soul. I've seen it. I went to Otupa. Somebody that I don't even know the person that died. But me and my friend who is an elder in the Methodist church arrived in the place say, let's go and visit these people they just buried somebody today and we came so he now spoke to them in Idoma and said he brought a preacher to bless them so he was my interpreter and I opened the scripture and I began to share the scripture I began to share and he was interpreting I began to share and the same thing happened again the spirit of prophecy came upon me and I began to prophesy and sorrow left that place. I've seen it twice there is a river the streams whereof make glad the city of God if that river is flowing from inside of you sorrow cannot have a stronghold it breaks and it doesn't matter if it's barrier scenario or you lost your job you there is a river it's not tied to job. If only you can allow the streams to flow. It has a capacity within himself to break the stranglehold of sorrow and to release gladness. 
gladness came so intensely that day in Otupa that they because they say that the woman had been crying and has not stopped for days when the yoke was broken he stopped that moment I know this river so if you see it, it, it no no I understand when somebody is like you and you cry cry but I can't understand that unbearable one can't can't understand that people from our church now came thinking that I'm full of sorrow to come and encourage me when they came a scripture a fresh scripture from the Holy Ghost was released upon my heart and I preached it for 30 minutes I found out that the people needed comfort more than I did. They came battered and broken. And the river had to break. The elder that, that led the team, when, when they came and God began to move, began to move, and God began to minister to her, there, there was no prayer to pray again. And I said, well, we came to encourage you, but now we found out that uh, you have encouraged us, so we are going. So I escorted them. What encouragement are you bringing to a man that the river is flowing in? I don't know what you are coming to encourage. There is a river. I can't understand it when a Christian is there in depression. For You allow the devil to take 40 days of your life. You are just in despair. You will give account of those 40 days. You will give account. I remember a woman the other time you know she traveled she's one of us and her husband drove her away from her anytime we begin to pray she'll begin to cry not because the Holy Spirit was ministering to her she was crying because of her husband drove her one day the scriptures opened to me and I began to preach about God Hallelujah. I preached about what? God. And the revelation was so strong. Then I now say, how come you have given somebody so much authority in your life that the person can decide when you laugh and when you cry? And I struck it. I struck it. I kept, I don't know why I was saying that. I struck it and struck it and said that it's okay. I know why. You have made that person your God. That's why the person has so much influence over your life. The day you decide to rebel, that hold that the person has over you will break and you'll be free. The power of God hit her and she rose up from that day. That yoke. I've seen it. A river. If it comes in contact with anything that is depression, sorrow, it lifts it up. I was with my wife in Lagos and I woke up from sleep I say ah that we steal our car that we steal it you'll be expecting that maybe pastor should speak faith what's of faith I say this way God has spoken to me anytime he speaks like this it happens our car we go Aye. Two days later, we woke up and they stole our car. And then they say, we had to do something about this. Said, all right, no problem. Now, you know what? Let's all go and sleep. When we wake up tomorrow and we wake up where we'll sit down to discuss. Okay, let's, sorry, let's, let's, let's shut down. It's too early. Then when we woke up, they were expecting the meeting to be scheduled. I say, from this day henceforth, nobody will speak about this car again in Jesus' name. So the car, they, see something was going on. God was showing me revelations of, of things. The river was flowing, and it didn't flow in the area of car. It was flowing on that thing, some things in this. So one brother that was staying with us now wonder, say, what kind of man is this man? See, 
River. River. My family members didn't know for about one month. My sister just knew now, and it's one almost one year now. Almost one year. She knew last week. You know, you when they steal something from you, you now go and paste it on Facebook. Then you put the car there and say, Alas, there's a river. I found security in Christ. And the reason why I'm like this is because I found Christ. I don't need a car to add to the sense of my being. If there's a car, well, good and fine, it helps us to run around. If there's no car, or car that is good, I tell you, just bounce and bless God. There is a river. There is a river. I don't know what, what, what is the source of your joy, but my own is not natural. There's nothing you can do to me that can make me moody. The more you apply pressure on me, that's when you see me on the pulpit, it's as if I want to fly. There is a river. Many times people have risen up and said, we will make you miserable. We will make you. If only they knew that the power of my mood is not in anything that is natural. They will not need to try. Who will make you there is a river. There's a river. After many years that they attempted to make me miserable, they now saw that they were irrelevant. They were not relevant. So they advised themselves to stop, not because I told them to stop. They just saw that it was impossible to make me. There is a river. The people I'm speaking about are my relatives. During my wedding, they now say, okay, we have caught him. We will not support him. He will beg. I have not begged. It's four years now. I have not begged yet. <laughs> I have not begged yet. The last time they saw me was on screen. Preaching the gospel. There is a river. Nothing of the earth should have the capacity to determine your mood. I receive my gladness right from the rivers that flows in the heavens. It says, even if the fig tree decides not to blossom, natural circumstances gang up to frustrate you he said yet i will rejoice in the lord i don't know about you when i was in school i didn't graduate with my mates extra year okay and many people who have extra year when you see them they are dead you need to be injecting them with adrenaline for survivor The thyroid gland, the pituitary gland needs help so that they can talk well and, and, and not lose their delicate balance. I was there. Friends, I have a testimony. There's nothing left to fear. <laughs> nothing left to fear. In that your situation that you call helpless, rise up and acknowledge that God has made provision to sustain you outside the natural. He has made provision for you. There's a provision for your joy. It's tied to the river. There's a provision for your supply of strength. It's tied to you securing yourself in the will of God. There's a provision for your refreshment. It's tied to you staying in the place of prayer and speaking in tongues until you are filled. If you operate on that plane, a time will come where nothing in the natural can determine anything around your life. I will mention your name. I will sing of your praise. Abba, Father, He man. I will mention your name. <laughs> I will sing. 
speak to yourself rejoice in the Lord rejoice in the God of your salvation he will make your feet like hinds feet and you will ride upon your high places we must come to that point where the natural realm cannot affect us even if the victory fails
and decide to rebel against the devil. That prison house that the devil has placed you, you can decide to come out at will. Stop dancing to the rhythm of darkness. It's time to, for you to spread yourself. you, put you in a box, confine you. Allow the rhythm of the river to make you glad. That one is a lie.
There is a river. Instead, is always my, my God. Straight to begin to happen right now. I'm seeing some wells. Try Lanaski. See Babola Nataka Bala. In Jesus' name. Two things I want to do tonight. God is going to give people fresh tongues. Fresh tongue. Fresh tongue. Now, listen, there will be diverse kind of tongues everywhere. If you don't have a, a fresh tongue, you don't need to. It will, you can't hold it. It will flow like as if you are drunk. Holy Ghost. Close your eyes, please. Holy Ghost. the wells let the wells that are sealed these wells that have been sealed covered with earth let the seals begin to remove so that they oh my God I'm seeing strange things baptized people here are fresh let there be a fresh baptism a fresh baptism a fresh baptism, a fresh baptism is coming, is coming, is coming, is coming. Bring that lady. Let people experience a fresh baptism, a baptism of the Holy Spirit with new tongues. Fresh wine, 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 fresh
fresh wine, fresh wine from the Lord. In Jesus' name. That is the river of God. When it comes, it breaks the yoke of sorrow. Takes you to a different pedestal. Suddenly, suddenly, suddenly. An utterance goes forth. An utterance goes forth suddenly. 